we've talked enough about the life that bites its owner. And so now we should discuss the opposite, the life that doesn't bite its owner. There are certain words <clears throat> which are a lot of trouble for us. Their meanings or these words can deceive us. And so we should take time to understand them correctly. These words that we would like to look at are the word life, the word jita or mind, heart, and the word I or we. So then there's, there's this condition that we call life where the body's still living, able to move, it breathes, can walk around, can eat, can speak, can do all the activities that for us make up life. And the ordinary person takes this life to be self, takes this life to be the atta, the self. But then if we look a little bit deeper, we see that inside this life there is mind. There is that which, which knows and experiences and thinks. And we see that this mind is in control of life. And so then we take this citta, the mind heart, as the self. But where is the truth in taking, thinking that life is the self or in thinking that the mind is the self? Where, where is the truth in these, these ideas? The self is just something that arises momentarily from time to time. It's certain ideas. It's a concept that arises occasionally in the mind. So where's the truth of, <clears throat> of all these things? Is life the atta, the self? Or is the jita the atta? Is the mind the self? Excuse us for using these Pali words, but they're a little bit more clear. And so we choose to use them. And so the, the child takes life as being the atta. Or then after growing up a bit, then the child takes the, the mind or consciousness as being the atta. And then when this misunderstanding develops a little more deeply, the child takes the various momentary feelings of the mind, the various kinds of awareness are taken to be the atta. A young child who doesn't know anything about motors and mechanisms, if they open the back of a pocket watch, they'd, they'd be quite shocked <clears throat> to see all those little gears and springs and, and things moving. And that child would, would think that this watch is living and that it was a self. This kind of concept of the child is much more than just imagination. There's, there's no intention by the child to dream up these, these ideas. But because of avicca or ignorance, the child doesn't know anything about the watch. And because of this not knowing, the child very easily gets, comes up with all kinds of crazy notions, such as that the watch is a self. Or 
the people living up in the forests, the uncivilized folks, when they see a car for the first time, they think this automobile is a living thing, is some kind of a self, because they don't know anything about automobiles when they see it moving and they think it has life and then they think it has a self or if they see an airplane they'd, they'd go and assume that that airplane must be moving because it can it can it must be living because it can move and fly and then they they take that living airplane to be a self. These are some examples of how this illusion of the concept of self keeps coming into our experience. And then we ourselves who aren't that much more developed than the, the primitive people out in the jungle, we also go around taking everything to be atta, to be self. Anything living or moving or whatever is taken as a self. So we take various robots or mannequins or all kinds of things as being self. Or there are certain paintings and pictures which are so realistic or lifelike that we wonder if it might not be living, if it might not be real. And then we take that, that living thing, that, that mind or whatever, and we see it, we take it to be a self. Just the way a child sometimes sees a painting of a wild animal and can be frightened by the painting because it takes it to be to be self to be a self or even adult if they take paper and paints and begin to paint a ferocious or frightening looking animal then very very quickly it becomes much more than just paper and paint it becomes quite terrifying. There's self in this thing. It's taken to be some kind of self, which is absolutely, which is really funny or silly that an adult would be frightened by just a bunch of colors on a piece of paper. But it happens quite often. And then we heard that there's someone in Thailand who who bought a, a reproduction of the Mona Lisa and so they could look at it and stare at it. They really became obsessed with it, thinking it was a living thing, that there was a self in that, in that picture. And this is how we can so easily be deceived by things, by appearances. So when it works in this way, then the primitive peoples in the, in the jungles, they take everything to be self. Their mind so easily thinks that everything is self. And so they take the sun to be a self and the moon to be a self. And they see storms and violent winds as being, as being selves. And certain special trees are selves in the rivers, in the mountains. They take all these things to be selves and make them into holy, holy objects. And then they worship these things. They worship certain trees. They think there's something living, some spirit in the trees or in the rivers, in the mountains, and all over the place. And so thus, the, the primitive person sees selves all over the place, sees selves, sees selfhood in just about everything.
or in the rice fields. Since ancient times, people have thought that there was a god of the rice field or a spirit of the rice field. And people would worship, make offerings to this rice god so that the plants would grow strong and produce a lot of rice. And so this, this illusion, this illusionary concept of self arises quite, quite easily for the human being. And all kinds of things are taken to be selves, even things like the rice fields and the rice plants. This gives us some examples of how, how the human mind sees self all over the place. This concept of self is just an illusion. It's just a concept which occurs in the mind. It doesn't really, it doesn't have a reality in nature. But there is this concept in the human mind that it has great power and influence. Because, because of, because of this concept, there arises all kinds of feelings such as positive and negative, happiness and sadness. And so there's tremendous power in this concept of atta, self, even though it's, it's just an illusion. And so then things that are living, that can move, bounce, shake, get up and walk around, we take these to be selves. But then when we see that there are these minds which think and experience and feel, we take those to be selves, to be atta. And then anything that we don't understand, things that seem to have power but we don't understand them, then we, we take them to be selves. And so this illusion of self gets projected upon all kinds of things, upon life, upon the mind, upon things we don't know or understand. If we can understand how these things deceive us, how life, how the mind, how the self deceive us, then it will not be difficult for us to understand Dhamma. When the mind is stupid, it, it stirs up all kinds of defilements, all kinds of wrong ideas and crazy concepts come up in the ignorant mind. And so this, then it bites its owner. When there are all these foolish thoughts for coming out of ignorance, then life bites its owner, or the mind bites its owner, which means that it bites itself. Itself is, is taken to be the owner. And so life bites itself, the mind bites itself, because of, because <clears throat> of ignorance. So the mind, the mind assumes that it has some kind of owner. But how could that ever be? The mind isn't even itself. The mind isn't even a self. How could it have something as its owner? If the mind isn't a self, then there's, there's no self that can own the mind. But this illusion arises in the mind because of ignorance. And so the, the mind sees things that don't exist. And because of this, it bites itself. Life bites itself. If the mind is ignorant, then it takes things to be self. And then it bites itself. The mind bites its owner. But when there's no ignorance, 
and the mind sees things according to truth, sees things as they actually are, then nothing is seen as self. Nothing, and so nothing, there's nothing to bite and no owner to be bit. And so the mind doesn't bite its owner. If things are understood correctly, according to the, the way they really are, there's no biting. So in short, the mind that doesn't understand keeps biting itself. But the mind that understands, that has knowledge, has the highest level of knowledge, it doesn't bite anything and nothing gets bit. We'd like to use the metaphor of a life that is, of a mind that is like a diamond, a diamond mind. As you know, diamonds are very hard. They're very hard substances. They're so hard that there's just about nothing that can cut a diamond. However, these very hard diamonds can cut other things. So the diamond is that which is so hard that it can't be cut, but can cut other things. This is how our minds should be. The mind that is like a diamond is a mind that has the highest understanding, has the highest wisdom. And this highest wisdom that makes the mind like a diamond is the, the knowledge or the understanding we call a tammayata, a tammayata. The mind that has this a tammayata has the highest possible understanding and it's a mind like a diamond. Nothing can cut it. We said earlier that any, any woman or girl who has a tamayata, there will be no man who can, who can pick her up. Gyo, the Thai word here is the same, means trick her into loving him. So any woman who has a tamayata, will not be susceptible to men making her fall in love with him. Or any man who has a tamayata won't, there won't be any possibility of any woman or girl making, making him fall in love. The mind that understands this fact of a dhammayada is a diamond mind. So we hope you'll be interested in understanding and having within your minds this thing we call a dhammayada. This word da which at the end of a dhammayata in the Pali language can have various meanings. It can mean the state or, excuse me, the quality of being a certain way, having a certain characteristic. In this case, having the quality that nothing can concoct it this is one way that, one meaning of atamayata, that this quality or characteristic of being unconcoctable, where there's nothing that can come in and cook it up or concoct it. Da can also mean a state of being. So then, which is more than just a quality or characteristic. 
And so a dhammayata can also mean the state of being that is unconcoctable. Or it can mean an, an insight knowledge, a jnana, the a clear and penetrating knowledge into the nature of things. A dhammayata can signify this highest knowledge. Or a dhammayata can mean a power, this diamond-like strength that has the power to with, withstand anything that can cut through anything. And finally, a dhammayata can be a dwelling or a vihara dhamma, which means a, an abode or dwelling, a way of, a way of living. A dhammayata can be the, the ordinary mode of living that the mind dwells in. The mind is always dwelling in a dhammayata. For example, if a young woman all the time dwells in a dhammayata, then there won't be any man or, or boy or who can come along and trick her into falling in love with him. By dwelling we mean the place where the mind lives. It can, means like a house or a home. The mind can take a dhammayata as its home, as its dwelling place. The mind that dwells in a dhammayata is a mind that won't bite anything. And it's a mind that can't be bitten by anything. If the mind takes a dhammayata as its home or dwelling place, then it's, it's beyond being bit or biting. And this is, this is the highest understanding that we can have in life. And it leads <coughs> to, to complete freedom and peace. And since Adamayada is so important, we should take some time to examine its meaning until we understand it correctly. Although it may take a long time, it's necessary for us to study a dhammayata until we, we understand it thoroughly. And so this is what we intend to do. We're trying to put this word, a dhammayata, into the vocabulary of ordinary people so that this becomes a common spoken word in the language of, of most people. Although, although the word Adamayada appears in a number of places in the Pipitika, the Buddhist scriptures, it's almost completely unknown by Buddhists. This word is there, but it's it's completely ignored. And so, Buddhists in Thailand, as well as other countries, don't know anything about a Dhammayata. And so they probably don't have any Dhammayata, even in the least little bit. And so it's been ignored and forgotten, even by Buddhists. And even in the Pali dictionary compiled by famous Western scholars, they don't have this word atamayada, maybe because they're afraid to print a word that they don't understand, but they left it out. And then even in our normal, the, the ordinary English dictionaries, is there any dictionary that has the word unconcoctability? Have you ever found this word in Webster's or, or such, such dictionaries? 
Isn't this a little bit amusing that the word that has the highest meaning and the highest value isn't even printed or included in any of our dictionaries? Sometimes it's beyond our ability to explain Atamayeta with words. We have to try and use other other things as well. But most of all, we have to implore you to look carefully into this thing yourselves. And so when we give you an example, such as the young woman with Atamayeta in her mind, in her heart, so that there's no man anywhere that can pull a fast one on her, who can trick her and make her fall in love. What, what quality, what state of mind, what kind of knowledge is in that woman's mind so that she is totally free of the tricks and games of any man? The word, there's not, there's no words that a man could speak that would affect her mind. No matter what any man would say, it has no effect on her mind. Her mind re remains clear and cool. There's no words for the mind that has a dhammayata. There aren't any words anywhere that can concoct the mind into positive and negative. Literally, a dhammayata can be taken to mean the state that where nothing can concoct, the state that is completely beyond being concocted. Or if we use a, a word, a more material word, it's a mind that, it's the state that is not the product of anything. Where the, it's the state where the mind can't be produced by anything. Is this too good for you? Are you thinking that this is way too good and not something really that I, I want at all? Are you thinking that I'm not very interested in this atamayata? Are we someone who still is very excited by, very enticed by our moods and emotions, and who likes being carried away by moods and emotions? If you're such a person, you may be thinking that atamayata is, is too good, that it's it's too good for us. Adamayata is to be above all those moods and emotions, to, to be beyond them so that they have no more power over the mind. Whether this is too good or not is something for you to see for yourself. If this is what you think, if you think that that a dhammayata is too good for you or something that you're not interested in, then we must tell you that your life will bite itself. Your life will bite itself over and over again if you have such an attitude towards a dhammayata. Besides being unconcoctable, the mind that has a dhammayata is also uncatchable, and untrappable. There's nothing that can catch it, hold it, and trap it when the mind has a dhammayada. However, the mind that doesn't have a dhammayada is always being caught and trapped by things, by ignorance, by the deceptions of positive and negative. The mind that doesn't understand, doesn't have a dhammayada, is always getting caught in, entrapped by <coughs> all the, the objects and things in the world around us. And then once it's caught, it gets bit. There's 
there's not any delicious flavor or taste anywhere in the universe that can dominate the mind of one who has a Dhammayada. Whether ordinary delicious flavors or heavenly delicious flavors or the most special and magical and refined kind of delicious tastes, none of these whatsoever can grab the mind that has a Dhammayada. They can't dominate it. They can't control it. To put it more simply, in somewhat crude terms, a Dhammayada is not having to go wandering around the world looking for delicious things. We ought to look and see if these kind of things exist in our world. Is there, is there much of this wandering around looking for delicious things in our world? Is this something that humanity is doing on a large scale or not? Is our world largely lacking in a Dhammayada so that people are traveling all over looking for things that are delicious, that make them feel good? Is this the kind of world we have, people who don't have a Dhammayada and so are getting caught and trapped by all kinds of wonderful, delicious flavors and sights and sounds and all kinds of things. And then the highest advantage of a Dhammayada, which we, we keep having to, we must repeat over and over again, is that the mind with a Dhammayada is above the power of everything in the world. All things in the world either have the m meaning of positive or negative. That's what the world is, all these positive and negative things. With a Dhammayada, the mind is above everything in the world. That means the mind is above the power of, of all these positive and negative things to influence it. There's no crying and no laughing. There's no need for sadness or for gladness. There's no more of this laughing and crying and sadness and gladness anymore. There's no more being the winner nor being the loser. There's no more being the debtor the one who's in debt, nor is there one being the credit, is there any being the creditor. There's no getting, being the one who gets, or the one who loses. The mind is above <clears throat> all these illusions. But if one still likes laughing and crying and getting and losing and <clears throat> winning and being defeated, then there's not much that can be done to help such a person. They'll never be interested in a Dhammayada. Everyone is quite enticed and infatuated with the positive. Everyone thinks the positive is really wonderful and great. But then at the same time, One's always being defeated by the negative. The negative causes us to hurt, inflicts pain and, and suffering upon us. But with the Dhammayada, one is above any power or influence of both the positive and the negative. Neither of them can take over the mind. Neither of them can control and dominate the mind if there is a Dhammayada. It's beyond our ability to define a Dhammayada in just a few words. It's hard to understand this by using words. 
But what we can do is talk about the context or the situation in which there is a Dhammayada. And you can, if you pay careful attention, you can start to see a Dhammayada as we talk about the things surrounding it. So as we've said, we can use the metaphor of the diamond. A Dhammayada is a diamond that, where, that can cut anything, but can't itself be cut by anything. It can cut everything, but nothing can cut it. Exactly what that's like, you have to pay attention to and find out for yourself. And then you can go and define it in whatever words suit you best. So now we'll look into and study the the point. What do we do to have a dhammayada? As knowledge, a dhammayada is the highest knowledge and understanding that there is. As a state of being, a dhammayada is the highest possible state of being for the human mind. As, as a, as a power, a, a dhammayada is the most powerful thing that the mind can have. Just as we've said, it's like a diamond. <clears throat> it's just like in the world where diamonds are considered great wealth, the most expensive kind of things. In the same way, a Dhammayada is the most valuable possession that the mind can have. But to achieve such a high knowledge or power, we have to use lower, lower levels of understanding, lower, lower conditions as a kind of stairway up to a Dhammayada. This is what we'll, we'll look at now. There are many levels to knowledge and understanding. There's the kind of knowledge that we find in books that we hear from others. This is a genuine kind of, this is a kind of knowledge that has its, its value and benefits. But then the knowledge that comes when we take what we've read and we use reasoning and logic to analyze it and consider it, and then we come to certain more basic conclusions. This is a higher kind of knowledge than the first kind. But even that isn't good enough. It's not the highest kind of knowledge. <clears throat> the highest kind of knowledge is to go beyond the knowledge of, of reading and the knowledge of reasoning to the kind of knowledge that is direct experience, to have a direct, immediate spiritual experience of something. This is the highest knowledge. So there are these various levels of knowledge. The common person, for most of all, just knows the first level and some of the second. Some people have developed the, level, the knowledge of reasoning even further. But we have to go beyond that to the highest level of, of understanding which is that of direct spiritual experience. We have to find, or we ought to, we need to make this kind of direct spiritual experience regarding all things. So there are three basic steps or stages to understanding. First, there's the knowledge we get from outside ourselves, is the first stage. 
then there's the second stage of of digesting that that knowledge digesting it using reasoning using wise skillful reflection to come to more more precise and more truthful understanding but then there's the third stage of having a direct intimate experience of that thing where the mind knows that thing directly realizes that thing directly without any need of thought or words or 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 language but there's a direct realization of of the thing these are the three three stages of understanding getting something from outside ourselves digesting it with reason and reflection and then making a direct experience realizing the thing directly and so in knowing anything including a dhammayata one goes through three stages of deepening understanding there's also another way there's another kind of progression or stairway to a dhammayata there are eight steps that we can take to a dhammayata actually there are many different ways that we could talk about climbing up to a dhammayata but the one we're going to talk about now is one that we feel is most appropriate and will make it most clear and simple for you to understand there are eight dhas which are the steps leading to a dhammayata this word da as we mean, mentioned earlier means characteristic or state of being and so on there are eight of these and together with a dhammayata there there are nine das nine das that we will discuss the first one is anicca da anicca da the fact of impermanence the fact that everything in the world is constantly changing that all things in this world of ours are 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 changing ceaselessly that nothing stays the same that there's constant change if one sees this if one sees that everything is changing this is called anicca da this means that everything that we experience everything in our world depends on causes and conditions and these can causes and conditions of things are changing all the time and if the causes and conditions change then the thing itself must change as well this is what we mean by the fact of impermanence that everything that exists exists only through causes and conditions which change and so the things ex- themselves exist this is what we mean by anicca da which literally means the fact of impermanence or the fact of instability that things don't remain the same they don't stay the same one can see that in this world whenever two things come together you get something new and we always have these things moving and coming together and always producing something new whether the causes or the conditions or the the fact uh, various affecting factors whenever a new one gets involved there's there's change and this is the constant situation in our world where things are interacting ceaselessly constantly producing new things this is the condition that we call anicca da impermanence whenever two things come together there's a transformation of energy for example when a, 
a male and a female come together, we always get something new. This constant production of new things is what we mean by impermanence, the fact of impermanence. This impermanence is nothing else but the flow of evolution. This endless process of transformation and evolution that we are a part of, this is exactly the same thing as anicetta. Without anicetta, there would be no evolution. You've already studied biology well enough to understand this fact quite simply, quite easily. Imagine what it would be like without impermanence. Everything would just stay the same. We'd have to go through everything over and over and over again. And nothing would ever change. And we'd get so bored to pieces with everything. It would be totally boring. And so we ought to be quite thankful for impermanence. Only because of, because of impermanence, life is always giving us something new from moment to moment. There's always something completely new thanks to anicetta. What we call deliciousness is just a deception of impermanence. If, we, if you took the most delicious food and had to eat it over and over and over again, that deliciousness would disappear quite quickly. But because of the impermanence, because we're always changing what we eat, there is this illusion of deliciousness. Things can only be delicious because of impermanence. Let me give an example which may be a little bit silly, but the cream crackers that we ate 60 years ago tasted a lot more delicious than the cream crackers that we eat today. Whether it's, the, it's a change in the cream crackers themselves or a change in our nervous system, who can say? But now we see quite clearly that the cream crackers are a lot worse than they were 60 years ago. So whether it's change in the crackers or, or change in whatever, where is, whether it's the impermanence in the crackers or impermanence, whatever, things are changing all the time. And this constant change is always giving us new tastes to, to sample, to enjoy, always giving us new samples of deliciousness. This is what, this is just the way it is with anicetta. So whether it's changes in the things we eat or changes in our tongue and the, the nervous system, you should examine this carefully. If we understand this point, then we won't, we'll, we won't create a lot of problems for ourselves about what we eat. If we understand this, we won't go liking this and disliking that, wanting it to be this way or wanting it to be that way. If we understand this fact of impermanence, we won't get so trapped in our likes and dislikes, which bring up the feeling of positive and negative. And it's a fact that the cream crackers they made in England 60 years ago aren't the same as the cream crackers they make in Malaysia today, even if the container looks just the same. Where's, where's the anicetta? Where exactly is the impermanence? If we understand this, 
then life won't bite itself. Life will stop deceiving itself. If we understand Anicca Da. Next we come to the second Da, that is Tukka Da, the, the state of all the different kinds of tormenting that exist. Because all the things that we live with, that we associate with, that we get involved with, because they're all changing all the time. But on the other hand, there are many of them that we don't want to change, or the ones we want to change more quickly. Because of this, we get into struggle in conflict with these impermanent things. And this gives rise to the quality of torment. Because we must live with, associate with, and depend upon impermanent things, the, the quality of dukkha, of pain, of misery, of torment, must occur. This is, this is very close to us. It's right here in front of us. We ought to look at this carefully to see that because we're, we must live with all these changing things, there must arise dukkha. Because we must live with all kinds of things such as our, our wealth, our possessions, our clothing, our fame, our status, our honor, and so on. And all of these things are changing all the time. There must be, there must be dukkha. Or because, or even that we live with a husband or wife. And they're changing all the time. And so because of this, there must be the characteristic of dukkha. Because all the things we attach to are constantly changing. This is the fundamental cause of tukkata. Tukata. The condition of having to live with things which we must endure is what we mean by dukata or tukata. Because there are all these things that just being with them requires that we endure them. This itself is this characteristic of dukkha. For example, Having to be with the things we love requires a certain kind of endurance. And then, of course, being with the things we hate is a, a whole other kind of endurance. To be with the things we, that make us happy is one kind of endurance. And the things that, that make us sad requires another kind of endurance. Because we have to endure all these things. This state of having to endure things is what is meant by tukata. When we laugh, <clears throat> or when we're happy and, and bubbly and everything, the heartbeat starts to pick up and the blood pressure increases. So even in laughter and happiness, there is something that must be endured. It has to be endured. There's this, it's something that must be born <clears throat> or bared. And then with crying and sadness, it's, of course, even more. There's even more to be endured. If things are positive, it's fun to endure them. We enjoy enduring things that are positive, that make us happy. But then the negative things are very, very difficult to endure. It's very, very clear and obvious pain in having to endure them. But either way, it's an, a kind of endurance. We have to endure all these changing, unstable things.
Love must be endured. Greed must be endured. Hatred must be endured. Anger must be endured. Fear must be endured. Worry must be endure, endured. Excitement must be endured. All these things, without any exception, must be, be endured. All these things that we have to endure, this, this is the characteristic of, of dukkha, of, of pain, of painfulness. So there's the positive aspect of things are to trick us into enduring things. For example, on little sweets and cakes, they put a little bit of, they, a little smear of jam or jelly on them to make it more positive so that we're, so that we willingly endure these things. We've loved in the past and we continue to love things that are suffering, things that are dukkha, things that we have to endure, but because they've got a little positive quality to them, we, we love them. <coughs> we, because they're fun to endure, we love them. Things like, like sex, or like sexual pleasures, which are very, very tiring, really are a hassle. There's quite a bit that has to be endured about sex and sexual pleasures. But still, we're very happy to endure them. This is an example of the foolishness that keeps us tied, keeps us trapped in impermanent things. All the things that we, we love are things that <clears throat> change and that have to be endured. And so everything that we love has this quality of dukkha. So in fact, we love dukkha. The result is that we love suffering and misery. When we say this, probably nobody believes it. But the result of our way of living, our way of thinking and, and seeing things, is that we love suffering, we love misery. The word tukha, which we've been translating as that which must be endured, can also be translated as ugly. When you've seen how it has to be endured, you see it as ugly. This, this having to endure things is, is ugliness. This is another meaning of the word tukha or dukkha. And a third, a third way of understanding the word tukha is that these, these things that have to be endured and which are ugly for that reason, are completely empty of any real substance that it would be desirable, satisfying. There's, you can't find any such substance. This, the vacancy of this essence which would satisfy us is, is also ugly. So there's this ugly emptiness where in these things we can't find anything truly satisfying, anything, any essence that truly fulfills our desires. If we're going to understand the word tukha, or suffering, we need to understand all three of these meanings, because they're successively more, more profound. If we understand that all things have these three aspects of tukha, that they must be endured, and that there is this having to endure them is ugly, and that they're, they're completely empty of anything that can really satisfy, understanding all three aspects of dukkha is to thoroughly understand what we mean by the, the quality of suffering. 
And so to translate the word tukha as suffering is only one-third correct. It only covers one-third of the meaning. And as for the other two-thirds, we don't know how to translate it. So we're not going to bother, we're just going to use the Pali word tukha, which means much more than just suffering. And when we don't, when we don't understand tukha, we don't understand the things that are tukha, then we, we grab onto them, we fall in love with them. And when we love tukha like this, then it bites. This tukha bites life, bites its, the one who grabs onto it. This is what happens when we don't understand the second da, tukha da. Now we come to the third da, anatta da, not self. This is something which we must be particularly interested in because we can't control impermanence and we can't control the, the tukha <coughs> of impermanent things. That means we must endure all that, all that impermanence and all that tukha. There's no, there's no self that can control these things and none of these things are selves which can be controlled. It's this inability to control anything, whether our bodies, whether our minds, our thoughts, whatever, because we can't control any of them and stop them from being impermanent, stop them from being some being difficult to endure because we can't control them in any way. There's nothing anywhere that can really be taken to be I or mine, to be self or owned by self. There's neither a self that controls or a self that can be controlled. This is what we call not-self, anatata, anatata. Another important meaning of anatta that we ought to understand is that because things are not self, because they are impermanent and not self, this means that they can work naturally, automatically. The body, the mind can function naturally, automatically, because they are not self. If they were self, of course, they'd need something constantly making it do this, doing th that, constantly controlling it. But because our lives, our body and mind are not self, they can function naturally. But this is something that we generally don't see, we don't understand. For example, when the, a child opens the back of a mechanical watch, and see things whirling and spinning. The child thinks that it's an anatta. Sees there's movement. If there's movement, there must be a self controlling the movement. This watch must be, must be some kind of a self. This is how we, we generally understand things. We're deceived by the movement, by the change and we take it to be a self. But in fact, it's not self. Things just happen naturally. If we understand this, then we don't grab onto things. We don't try and be their owners. And so nothing bites. But if we misunderstand, then we get bit by everything that we, we try and possess and try and own. And then these bodies of ours, they can do a whole lot more than a watch can. They can walk, they can jump, they can dance, they can sing, they can eat, they can do all kinds of stuff. And so we take them to be self, we take the body to be a self. And then the mind, the mind can do a whole lot more even than the body. 
the abilities and powers of the mind are, are incredible. And so, even more so, we take all that to be self. We take the mind to be self. But what we don't see is that there's a natural mechanism in things. There's a natural mechanism within the body, within the mind, that allows them to perform their functions. Things operate, things work, things do what they do because of this natural function. The idea of self is just a concept produced out of our, our deluded thinking produced by our own, our own misunderstanding and stupidity. But the reality is that things just work in their own way by their own natural mechanisms. The nervous system can produce emotions all by itself. And then when an emotion arises, when the nervous system feels this emotion, then the mind takes it to be I, figures if there is an emotion, there must be the one who has the emotion. So we cling to the, the I who has the emotion. And so there's first just the naturally arising thing, the emotion. It happens just through the nervous system. But then the ignorant mind misunderstands and takes that to be a self. So the emotion comes first, the activity of the, the body-mind process comes first. Then only does there come the deluded idea that there must be a self, or an owner, or a controller, or an atta. So this is how it, how it always works. Life functions naturally by itself. But the ignorant mind misunderstands and keeps interpreting everything as being a self, that the body is a self, the feelings are selves, the perceptions are selves, the thoughts are selves, that sense consciousness is self. All these things are taken to be self and we go, we get trapped within this deluded conceptualization, this deluded thinking. But it's all really just an illusion. This, all this idea of self is just an illusion which is projected upon nature, upon reality. But this delusion has the ability to, to concoct the mind, to bite the mind. But if we understand it as just a delusion, just an illusion, and we don't believe in it, and see just how things happen naturally. We see that there's no need for a self anywhere, that there isn't any self anywhere. This understanding is what we call anatta. <laughs> if we tell you that the doer is born after the doing, you probably won't believe this. If you tell a child that the doer comes after the doing, they think you're crazy. Our normal way of seeing things is we assume that there must be someone to do it. If there's any action, there must be an actor who does it. But in fact, those are just our deluded assumptions about life. In reality, the doer comes from the doing. Because things are anatta, because there is not self, there's just the doing. But then we misunderstand it and project our idea of a doer upon the action. And so the doer is just a result of, of the doing. And that the doer is a illusion that comes out of our misunderstanding of the doing. All the activities of this body and mind happen naturally. There's no need for a doer, for an actor, for an owner. If we can understand this point, then we'll understand anatta. Now, 
This may seem illogical to some of us, but remember that logic is just a kind of thinking. And if all we do is think about things, then we'll never get to the truth. We're not talking about thinking about it logically. We're talking about observing reality, dealing with the facts themselves, not just our idea in logic. So there's nothing illogical about what we're saying because it, it fits the facts that the doer comes after the doing. Understand this and you'll understand anatta. When a child carelessly bumps into a chair or a bench or a post or a rock, it gets, there, it, there is pain because their, their foot or leg has struck against this hard object and there is pain. And then the child gets angry at the bench or the rock or whatever. Because of the pain, there's this physical activity of the pain, the child projects it as the, the one who hurts, the one who feels the pain, and then takes the rock or the bench to be a self also. Because of the ignorance in the child, the pain is taken to be I, and the rock is, or the bench, is to pay, be taken as self. And so the child gets angry at that thing. This is another example of how, how the idea, the concept of self, gets stirred up by the various activities in life. It doesn't exist all the time. It just arises occasionally when, when certain activities are misunderstood and taken to be self. When there's the inner, the inner self, the inner ego, then we also, there, all, there then arises its opposite, the the outer ego. And so there's the inner ego, and then it's got the outer ego to get angry at, or to, to hate, or to be afraid of, or to worry about, or whatever. Because we produce the idea of I who acts, or I who owns this action, then we also stir up the idea of the, the ego, the self, out there. So in this way we're producing this illusion of self both internally and all around us. <clears throat> and then this foolishness can go on so far that we even, we even project this self on inanimate objects, things that don't live and don't even move, such as sometimes you may have taken a glass and thrown it down in anger, breaking it, or maybe a plate or some other object. Taking an inanimate thing as a self and then getting angry at it so that we destroy it. This is how our, our foolishness can keep, keep growing and get carried away, where we project this illusion of self all over. When you, when you kick your car, for some reason. That's complete idiocy, where you've, you've taken the car to be some kind of self. So that's the essence of anatta. We've, we've had time only to talk about three das, but this is all the time we have to, to, for today, so we'll stop now and continue again tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being patient and enduring listeners. Whether this <laughs> enduring this talk has been dukkha for you or not, that's for you to know yourself. <laughs>